Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. So I don't care how I feel. I can feel insecure, but present myself secure. I can feel like I don't have confidence, but I can be confident. I can feel guilty and be righteous. I want you to get this today. God, give us the grace to get this today. The mind is really amazing. Your mind can go back into the past and get something that is way back over there somewhere. Sometimes it's good to remember things from the past, but then sometimes we need to forget things from the past. Your mind can also, through imagination, go out into the future. <laughs> and really what you do with your imagination is very important because Proverbs 23, 7 tells us that as a man thinks in his heart, so does he become. I don't know if we understand how powerful that is. I like to say it like this, where the mind goes, the man follows. The best way for me to make the point is to say, if you would put your mind on a hot fudge sundae <laughs> and you would keep your mind on it long enough, I can pretty much promise you that you'll end up with a hot fudge sundae. <laughs> you, um, you all get that principle, right? Some of you came to Hershey with your mind on chocolate when you got here. <laughs> Amen. Well, that's a funny little way to describe it, but the truth is, is where your mind goes, you do end up following in that direction. And so what we think is so important. Now, a lot of people think they can't control their thoughts. I know I thought that for a long time. Well, I can't help what I think. But see, you can. You can choose your thoughts, and you need to choose them carefully. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that if there's a wrong thought that comes into your mind, then you need to cast that one down. And you need to choose something from the Word of God to meditate on. Now, God has a wonderful plan for every person's life. Not just some people, every person. Every single person in this place watching by TV, God has a good plan for your life. But the Bible teaches us in Romans 12 something that we need to know, so let's go there. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Probably one of the first things that we should learn from the Word of God. Do not be conformed to this world. Paul's instructing Christians. He's saying, now don't go out there and act like the rest of the world. fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs. But be transformed, changed, entirely changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals, its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves. See, it's great to hear about the good plan that God has for your life, but you can prove it out in your life. You can actually step out on the promises of God. You can try the Word. You can try what God says to do and see whether or not it will work. So he says, God has a good plan for your life. And literally, I like to say it like this. If you learn to think how God thinks, then you will end up with that good plan that God has for you. Learn to think like God thinks. Now. The first place that Satan attacks all of us, his number one strategy in defeating us is to come against our mind, to put lies into our mind, things that do not agree with the Word of God. Or maybe he tries to do with us like he did with Eve, where he just kind of alters it just a little bit. Well, did God really say that? You shouldn't eat from that tree? Well, God just knows if you do that, then you'll be like Him. So He didn't totally deny the Word. He just twisted it a little bit. 
And I know that if you're a Christian, you've probably heard this till it's coming out your ears, but I'm going to tell it to you again. You have to know the Word of God for yourself. And it's going to require more than just hearing other people preach and teach. You are going to have to study. Nobody in their right mind that wanted to be a doctor would think that they could go be a doctor without years of study. And even if somebody did, I certainly wouldn't want to go to them. <laughs> well, what we have today is we have a lot of people with a lot of head knowledge, but we don't have nearly enough people with revelation. We have information, but we need revelation. And revelation, or the power to do what the Word says, comes through repetition, through hearing it over and over. It's almost like every time you hear the truth, it takes scrapes off another little layer of that deception that we live under. We have to hear teaching on the mind on some kind of a semi-regular basis. We have to hear teaching on the power of the words of our mouth on some kind of a semi-regular basis. Because if you don't get your mind straightened out, you'll never get your life straightened out. If you don't learn how to think like God and say what God says, there's no hope of you ever having what God wants you to have. I am going to repeat myself. If you do not learn how to think like God thinks and say what God says, there is no hope of you ever having victory in your life. And one more time, I'm going to say it, just to make sure nobody on this side missed it. If you don't learn how to think like God thinks and say what God says, there is no hope of you ever having victory in your life. Amen? And there's one more special group of people that I think I need to say it to, and that's our wonderful TV audience. If you do not learn <laughs> how to think like God thinks and say what God says, there is no hope of you ever getting your life straightened out. Now, it's going to take some work, it's going to take some effort, but you're going to be putting yourself into something. It might as well be something that's going to produce good fruit. It's not going to happen overnight, but as long as you're making progress, then little by little you're going to see changes in you and changes in your life. God has a good plan for you, but your mind has to be renewed. Now, how do we get from that old person that we were to the new person that the Bible tells us that we ought to be? The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become brand new. We can put off the old man, put on the new man. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. What good news it is to find out that you don't have to just think on whatever falls in your head. When you know the Word of God and something comes into your mind that you know is not in agreement with the Word, you can say, no, I'm not going to think that, and you can replace that wrong thought with a right thought. We all have a tendency sometimes to think bad things about other people, or suspicious things. Do you ever think suspicious thoughts? The person hasn't done anything wrong yet, but you've already got it fixed up in your mind that they're going to. And what I do with that kind of stuff now is the minute that I recognize that something like that is in my mind, I replace it with part of 1 Corinthians 13 that says, love always believes the best of every person. So sometimes I will even just say, nope, love always believes the best of every person. I'm going to believe the best. When we do that, we are literally doing warfare with the devil. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and thoughts and theories and every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the true knowledge of the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The devil is going to do warfare with your mind. You have to think about what you're thinking about. The next time you start feeling depressed, just ask yourself what you've been thinking about. You'll find the source of your depression. The next time you feel like giving up, just ask yourself what you've been thinking about, and you'll find the source of your wanting to give up. Amen? 
Ephesians 4.22, strip yourselves of your farmer nature, put off and discard your old unrenewed self which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. Let me just simplify it and say that Paul is telling the Ephesians, stop acting the way you used to act before you knew Christ. How many of you believe when we receive Christ that our behavior ought to change? Okay. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Constantly. This is a daily thing. Every day you're going to have to pay attention to your thoughts. Every hour you're going to have to pay attention to your thoughts. You need to pray about it. Holy Spirit, make me aware when I'm thinking something junky that doesn't agree with the Word of God. Holy Spirit, make me aware when I have stinking thinking. <laughs> and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude, verse 24, and put on the new nature, the regenerated self, that's been created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. Now, I like to look at verse 23 as a bridge to get me from verse 22 to 24. He starts out saying, stop acting like the old creature that you used to be and start acting the way God wants you to act. But that's impossible if we don't understand the middle scripture. Because the middle scripture says, and this is the way it's going to happen. You get from where you are to where you want to be by constantly renewing your mind and every day having a brand new attitude and learning how to think the way God thinks. Now, nobody can control your thoughts but you. The devil will try to, but he can't get by with it if you understand what I'm teaching you today. You can't just pray about this and expect God to take over your thoughts. These are instructions to us. You renew your mind. You cast down wrong thoughts and replace them with good thoughts. See, we think that whatever we think is our business. But let me tell you, whatever you think is what you will end up saying, and it will be what you will end up doing. That's exactly why the Bible says even to look at a woman and have lustful thoughts Really, as far as your heart is concerned, it affects you no differently than if you had adultery. To hate someone, the Bible says, affects you as if you murdered them. Our thoughts are powerful, and we need to start realizing that just because they're inside of us and we think nobody knows what we're thinking, well, number one, God knows what you're thinking. Come on. The Bible says he knows every word in our mouth that has not yet been uttered and every thought that we will think. He knows our thoughts are far off, the Bible says. Just because something is secretly going on inside of us, that doesn't mean that God doesn't know about it and it doesn't mean that we're not going to be accountable for it. It's foolish for people to think that they can sit around and look at pornographic material and that not affect their life. And that is such a huge, widespread, monstrous problem today. And so much of the world thinks that there's not a thing wrong with it. I'm not doing anything, I'm just looking. And it's not just unbelievers that do it. It's everywhere. You better learn what to get off your computers and what to block out of your TV. And you better learn what to not stare at it when it comes in a magazine in your home. Because I'm telling you, the devil's feeding it up in big doses. Amen? Renewing the mind comes through meditation on the Word of God. And I want to tell you a story that I was told in this last year by a well-known minister. There's a very good possibility that if I told you his name, you would have one of his books in your home. That's how popular he is. And yet for many, many, many years of his life, he had a terrible problem that nobody knew about but him and his wife and possibly a few people he might have sought counsel from. And he shared this openly on my TV program because he wants to see it help other people. He said, I secretly had a problem with lust from the time that I was a teenager. And he said, especially when I would see a beautiful woman, my mind would just begin to go all kinds of places where it shouldn't go. And he said, as a man of God and 
a minister, I was just under such conviction and condemnation, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I shared it with my wife because I didn't want it to be a secret between us, and she prayed for me, and I talked to a couple people for counsel, and they prayed for me, but I continued to have this problem. He said, I didn't even want to go to a swimming pool. I didn't want to, I didn't want to even take a chance on seeing a woman in a bathing suit because I knew what would happen to me if I did. And then set that aside for a minute as some things went on in his life. He began to understand like never before the power of meditating on the Word of God. Now at this point he wasn't even applying it to his particular problem, but he really felt like that God challenged him to start meditating on certain scriptures, certain portions of scripture, and to commit them to memory and to do it over and over and over and over and over and over until that particular scripture became a part of him. So for whatever reason, and I'm sure the reason is, is that God was answering his prayers, although he didn't know it yet. The first group of scriptures that he chose to meditate on were Galatians 5, 13 and 14. For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or an excuse for selfishness, but through love you should serve one another. Through love you should serve one another. For the whole law concerning human relationships is compiled with and in the one precept, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So here he's meditating for weeks, I guess. You should love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The way you meditate is you roll something over and over in your mind and you mutter it under your breath or you speak it out loud. I had such a problem with a shame-based nature because I'd been abused in my childhood. And I felt guilty all the time. I had a lot of condemnation. The devil had convinced me that my father abused me because something was wrong with me. So I had this record playing in my head for years, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me? Well, when I received teaching from the Word of God about righteousness, I began to get some head knowledge at least that I was right with God through the blood of Christ and that old person was dead. and. I really wasn't responsible for what my father did. There was no reason for me to feel ashamed and guilty. So I knew it in my mind, but the feelings continued. You know, what you know will eventually override your feelings. But don't think just because you read a scripture one time and even agree with it that that means all those feelings are going to go away. That's why when you hear messages on forgiving your enemies or those that have hurt you, you can pray the prayer of forgiveness and you can be sincere, but still the next time you see them, you'd like to choke them. You don't feel any different. And we are way too addicted to our feelings. We depend way too much on feelings. And we bow down to feelings when we should be bowing down to the Word of God. You can feel wrong and behave right. Come on. I don't have to feel like forgiving you to forgive you. And I can feel guilty and still know it's the devil attacking me and that he's a liar and that the truth is I have been made right with God through the blood of Christ and every time I do something wrong, the moment that I sincerely repent and turn away from it, I am completely given, forgiven and the Bible says God forgets it and removes it as far as the east is from the west. So you better get good at telling the devil, I don't care how I feel. Is anybody awake in the house today? We're just too wrapped up in how we feel. You need to say, I don't care how I feel, I know what the truth is. Well, I probably had to confess out loud and meditate on and study righteousness maybe for eight years before it got from here to here. Now, it doesn't look like it's that far from there to there, but I guess the deeper your problem is, the more deeply rooted your problem is. And if you are going to do anything for God, the devil is going to pull out the big guns and do everything he can to kind of try to keep you stuck. Amen? 
But I got a little better all the time. A little better, a little better, a little better, a little better, a little better. And then all of a sudden, I mean, I really got it. The lights went on. We are a new creature. That old person we were is dead and buried with Christ. And we have been, not will be, we have been resurrected to a brand new life. So I don't care how I feel. I can feel insecure, but present myself secure. I can feel like I don't have confidence, but I can be confident. I can feel guilty and be righteous. I want you to get this today. God, give us the grace to get this today. You are not what you feel. <laughs> you are what you believe, and your feelings will catch up with what you believe if you're steadfast. And don't just keep being double-minded back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Don't worship your feelings. Just get a grip and realize they're extremely fickle. You never know what they're going to do from one day to the next. You can go to fed, bed feeling great and wake up the next morning and feel like you stayed awake all night and ate nails and you don't have a clue what's wrong with you. Amen? Amen? One of the girls that's one of my assistants told me one day last week, she said, I just feel like hurting somebody today. <laughs> I said, well, I'm getting out of here then because it ain't going to be me. <laughs> Next day she came in, she said, I don't know what my problem was yesterday. Today I'm fine. <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. Before we have some spiritual maturity, we act on those feelings. If you felt like hurting somebody, then you hurt somebody. If you felt like telling somebody off, you told them off. If you didn't feel like talking, you didn't talk. On and on and on. But the more mature you become, the more you realize that you don't have to let how you feel rule you and control you. So to meditate on something means to roll it over and over and over in your mind and to mutter it until it becomes a reality to you. So he'd been meditating on this Galatians 5, 13 and 14. The greatest thing is love your neighbors, you love yourself. We're called to serve one another through love. He was on a vacation with his family and his grandchildren were there and the grandkids wanted to go to the swimming pool and he's already dreading going to the swimming pool. He didn't want to go. But he went down anyway and sure enough, here comes a beautiful girl in an itsy bitsy teeny weeny. <laughs> Not a yellow polka dot bikini. <laughs> And right away he's thinking, oh no. But to his utter amazement, after years of torture, because he had now been meditating on this word, he said the first thing that he thought when he saw that girl was not something lustful and ungodly, but he thought, I wonder if that girl's father loved her the way God wanted her to be loved. I wonder if maybe she thinks that she has to present herself like that because it's the only way that she knows how to get what she thinks is love. He began to pray for her and all of a sudden he realized <laughs> and then he knew. He knew that he knew that he knew <laughs> that his new freedom was a result of meditating on the Word. Now, let me just tell you something. Most people's minds are like a wild, undisciplined animal. Just because you're sitting here does not mean that you stay here all morning. You may have already been 25 places since you got here today in your mind. And today, especially because there's so many images coming at us at once, it's even more and more difficult to focus and to concentrate. So meditating on the Word is something that you're going to have to really want to do. Now, that little book that I show you all the time, The Secret Power of Speaking God's Word Out Loud, that can be extremely helpful to you. And those of you who have it and use it properly, what you can do is you can take a portion of those first-person confessions 
that are divided up in categories for you, and let's just say that you're having a problem, somebody's hurt your feelings, you have a problem getting over it. Then you open up to that portion about forgiveness and loving your enemies, and you just walk around and read it out loud, and read it out loud, and read it out loud, and you just tell the devil, I am going to read this to you until you shut up. So if you're a lazy Christian, today is the day to get over it. If you're the one who always wants to get in somebody's prayer line so they can pray your problems off of you, today is the day to get over it. Because if you want to have victory, you're going to have to find out what the Word says, and you're going to have to think like God thinks, and you're going to have to learn how to say what God says. Amen? Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, and that means completely changed, by the renewal of your mind. Such a great scripture. Insurgency have gone around Iraq, persecuting Christians, forcing them to leave their villages, their homes, their businesses. Many of those families have seen their children abducted, their husbands being killed right there in front of them. The Iraqi Christians are persecuted intentionally in Iraq. So all the families are leaving. The majority has come to Lebanon because they feel safe, because there's a big Christian community. When we looked around, uh, and uh, so the need uh, of the Iraqis, we felt the Lord is leading us to the target this group of people for the love and compassion we can provide. Hand of Hope was the first ministry to come alongside with us. Hand of Hope said, well, we want to be the hand of Jesus to the broken world of Lebanon. In a children's program, when kids come and learn about Jesus and go back home and they sing what they have learned, the worship songs, the families, they start asking questions. Why are kids so happy and joyful again? Why do they have their smiles back again? Because in Iraq, the kids stayed home 24-7. They're not allowed to leave home, to play, to have fun, because they're scared of car bombing, of kidnapping uh, for ransom. So here they're finding their joy again, and it's exciting for us. Joyce Meyer makes this happen. Uh, Joyce Meyer uh, supports the Heart for Lebanon Iraqi project. So all the food we buy, uh, if it was the snacks, the lunch, the trips we do, the camps, the retreats, all of that, and alone we cannot do it because it's a big burden and it's high expense. And uh, they want to help us bless the Iraqi refugees by that. So we feel cared and loved by that as well. Elke gedachte roept emoties in ons op. Kan jij hier goed mee omgaan? Laat je niet leiden door jouw gevoelens. Joyce Meyer heeft daarover een boek geschreven. Zodat jij de baas wordt over jouw emoties. Leven boven je gevoel. Bestel het boek Leven boven je gevoel nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en je krijgt regelmatig exclusief een video van Joyce op jouw Facebook met korte, inspirerende boodschappen die voor nieuwe impulsen zorgen in je dagelijks leven. Dat en meer bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.